As the light of Christ is brought in, I believe that the craft boys are going to bring that in for us, Elliot and Deacon Greg. And uh, Donna is going to lead us in our prelude as we direct our hearts and minds, our spirits to the Spirit of God in this time of worship this morning. Good morning. My name is Tori Benedetto, and I am your worship assistant this morning. I invite you to stand and join me in the call to worship. As a shepherd seeks a lost sheep, so God seeks and saves the lost. Like a woman who searches for a lost coin until it is found, so God As a father receives a returning, a returning wayward son, so God loves us and lets us ask and ask. Therefore, let us praise God in thanksgiving that we are saved. 
accepted and received. Let us receive God's acceptance and rejoice with one another in the name of Jesus Christ. Our hymn of praise is all our welcome, printed in your bulletin.
Please join me in the unison prayer. Gracious God, we await the touch of your spirit with eagerness. We ask that you enter the lives of each of us today, refreshing and renewing and healing us with the power of your loving spirit, that we may live with purpose, enthusiasm, and courage after the manner of Jesus, who was truly whole. Please join me in the scripture litany of God's love. Please be seated. <laughs> God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. We love because he first loved us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Will hardship or distress or persecution or feminine or nakedness or peril or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor death nor anything else in all invite us into a moment of silent prayer and offer you this focus and if you don't know what you already want to be praying about this morning um, your focus might be how we reach out in love to those around us so a moment of silence to lift up your own prayers and maybe on that focus of how we reach out in love to those around us thank you Donna for playing
Loving God, you have set for us an example of love. You have taught us to welcome the stranger, to greet those in need, to seek the lost, and to extend the gift of hospitality to all. We have learned that the greatest of your commandments is to love you with everything we have and to share that love with our neighbors. Help us, Lord, see our neighbors. Help us learn their names and listen to their stories. Help us look past the things we think separates us from them and welcome them in the love of Christ. For the light of Christ is meant to be shared and not hidden. And as we grow better accustomed to loving our physical neighbors, help us learn to love the neighbors that we have that live miles and cultures away so that your kingdom may flourish upon this earth. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior and teacher who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass I want to invite our young people to come forward for the Sermon on the Steps at this time. <clears throat> share a book with you this morning. I, the teacher in me loves children's books and I collect them. So those of you who ever want to give me a gift, if you find a great children's book, bring it on. I'm always looking for good ones. I came across this one on the internet and bought it because it talks about our theme for today, welcoming. This book actually takes place in a classroom and I was, as I was reading this book, I began to wonder what would happen if our church were as welcoming as our classrooms. So I want us to keep that in mind as we hear this story together. This takes place, where do you think? In the country? Where do you think, Isaac? In, in maybe in New York, maybe, or could be Jackson. In a city, that's right, Sarah, I think so. The taxi cab kind of gives that away, doesn't it? Okay, can you all see the pictures? And this one is called All Are Welcome by Alexandra Penfold. Pencil sharpened in their cases, bells are ringing, let's make haste. School's beginning, dreams to chase, all are welcome here. Say that with me, all are welcome here. And now when I get to the end of each page, we're gonna repeat that same thing. So let's try that again. All are welcome here, everyone. All are welcome here. No matter how you start your day, what you wear when you play, or if you come from far away, all are welcome here. Look at all the different places that God's people come from on the world map, yeah. In our classrooms, safe and sound, or how about in our sanctuary, safe and sound, Fears are lost and hope is found. Raise your hand, we'll go around. All are welcome here. Gather now, let's all take part. We'll play music, 
We'll make art. Do you play music and make art at your schools? Yeah. That was always one of my favorite parts. We'll share stories from the heart. All are welcome here. Look, they've got a story rug, just like I've got down in my basement for my grandchildren. I love story rugs. Time for lunch, what a spread. A dozen different kinds of bread. Pass it around till everyone's fed. All are welcome here. Open doors, rush outside. We will swing, we will slide. We'll have fun side by side. All are welcome here. Oh, and look, they've got, I love this picture. What do you see in this picture before I read it? What do you see, Isaac? Oh, that's right. Everybody from all the different countries, with all the countries there. And what are the children doing? What are they doing, Elliot? They're holding hands, aren't they? Yeah, they're holding hands. I love that picture. We're part of a community. Our strength is our diversity, a shelter from adversity. All are welcome here. All are welcome here. And then I'm going to skip that and go to the back of the book where it says, you have a place here. Do you think that anybody is supposed to be left out of this picture? No. In fact, I think that everybody, all, can you read this with me? What is it? All are welcome. All are welcome. Now, welcoming people who aren't the same as you, what does that mean? Hmm? Does it mean laughing at people if they dress differently? No. Does it mean turning away from someone who speaks a different language than you speak? No. What does it mean? It means reaching out and sharing what we have and caring for people who are different and accepting them just the way they are because that's the way God accepts us. Let's pray together. We thank you, God, that you have created so many children around the world with all of our differences. Help us to know that all are welcome in your love. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. You may go back to your families, and I'm going to invite Clayton and Tori and Megan and Earl to come forward now for an announcement by Staff Parish. Good morning, everybody. My name is Earl Pileski. It is my privilege and duty to be your Staff Parish Relations Committee Chair. Uh, I've got some information for you today, and I look forward to passing it on to you. In the past few months, in addition to dealing with the pandemic, we've had more changeover in our lay staff than at any time I can remember. I think the last time I saw this much changeover in our lay staff was probably in 1978 when uh, Tim and Lori came to be with us. Uh, as we announced earlier, uh, Don Dorr has left the office and is pursuing a new career in teaching. Our building manager, Jim Oldenburg, has had some health issues and is not working currently. The work around the building is being handled by our two relatively new part-time custodians, Calvin Drake and Keith Avery. 
and by our sturdy volunteers, Jim Myers and Paul Buss. I ask for your prayers that Jim Oldenburg's health issues will be resolved and that he will be able to return to us as our building manager. We're fortunate to have our hardworking and steady financial secretary, Teresa Oldenburg, in the office, and she has been so helpful as we have addressed our staffing shortages. And of course, Tim Munier is having a good time getting the music ministries going for the 44th time this year, 44th time this fall. We cannot forget our clergy, of course, Pastor Tanya, Deacon Greg, and our own Julie Nygaard, as they work very hard for us. They are the relative old hands now. <laughs> Meanwhile, we've been very fortunate to attract three new members of our staff, and you see them uh, behind me. First, I want to introduce you to Clayton Saren. This is his first day at work. I'm, I'm not incorrect, is that right? Clayton's first day at work. He is a video engineer and a production support specialist at Spring Arbor University, and he came to us with the hearty recommendation of our own Dory Shelby. He and his wife Autumn live in Marshall along with their little daughter, Juniper. And so Clayton is going to work uh, between four and six hours a week on Sundays to oversee our technology during our worship, uh, like our audio, video, live stream, and our lighting. I'm sure he is watching us with a critical eye even this morning. So that's Clayton Saren. Our second new person, of course, with whom you're familiar, is Megan Kraft. Megan and her husband, Jason, who is our lay leader, they've been here for more than eight years, and you have seen the two young men who help with, help with the lighting and who come up for the sermon on the steps. Uh, she will be our executive assistant, so she's going to assist uh, Pastor Tanya on a part-time basis, and she'll assist leadership council and the other church leaders. And so we're looking forward to having Megan in the office. Last and not least, our own Tori Hirschman, Jr. Started just this past week, and she's continuing to be active in the church as she always has been, but she will now work for us on a full-time basis as our communications director and staff support. So she'll be working all around uh, social media. She'll be in the office. The office will be well covered. And uh, I see that uh, her hours will include, once everyone is squared away, uh, Friday mornings, uh, which have not been opened at the church for a long time, I think, due to our staffing shortages. So those are our three new folks. All of them are dedicated persons who come to serve us as we continue to spin up our ministries from the virtual full stop of the pandemic. We hope also to grow our ministries and we have staffed to have the capacity to do that. It's a little risky to staff up this way because it costs money. But I have faith that the risk will be worth the reward of growing the ministries here at First Church. We're very excited about this group of faithful stewards and hope you are too. Friends, I'll be asking for a response from you in a moment. We need the congregation to stand alongside our staff as they work hard for this church. There will be times when they make mistakes and all of them will be learning. There will also be times that bold and new ideas will be put forward and it will take faith to embrace them. We will be asking you to volunteer, and I hope that you will say yes when that request comes. And so members, come on, come on forward here, folks. Come on, so they can see you. Come on up up front. Our new folks who are taking a little risk themselves to be here and with us. Members of this household of faith, will you stand beside our staff physically and spiritually, and support them in their work. Let us all say, yes, we will.
as you're able, I invite you to stand and we are going to offer a blessing on your work and on this congregation. And as a symbolic act of, lay, act of laying on of hands, I'm going to invite all of you to lift your hands toward Clayton and Megan and Tori at this time. One or two hands. You may do this or this, whatever is comfortable for you. And let us pray together. We thank you, O oh God, that you call us forward on this journey of faith. We give you thanks that you raise up leaders to fulfill the needs of your faith community and to carry out the ministry in our communities far and wide. We give you thanks that you have called forth Clayton and Megan and Tori to be among us. Pour out your spirit on them as they offer their gifts and graces, their passions and their service to help this congregation be more faithful and fruitful and effective in this time. Grant us the grace and the courage and the charity to be patient and to love to expect the best and to forgive when our ex expectations are not met. But through all of us, teach us how to welcome one another fully as we have been welcomed and to live out each in our way what it means to be faithful disciples of Christ. In his name and for the sake of his work, in this community we pray, amen. Welcome all of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you congregation.
please join me in our offertory invitation. God has filled our lives to overflowing with his abundant gifts of grace. Let us respond to God by offering him our love, our gifts, and ourselves. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for trusting us with the task of feeding the hungry, housing the homeless, offering hope to the desperate, and love to the unloved. Make us faithful and courageous in your ministry, and may we use these gifts to your glory. Amen. Donna, before the doxology, I just want to remind us, especially those of you who are new to us, during this time of COVID, we're doing our offering a little differently. You may place your offering, if you're here in person, in one of the um, plates here in the front of the sanctuary as you leave today, or you may um, make a gift through the mail and uh, Teresa, our treasurer, is here for a couple days a week to receive those and deposit them. We also have a few online options as well. You can do uh, an electronic fund transfer by working with Teresa. You can give through PayPal, or you can make a one-time credit card gift, again, through Teresa. We give you thanks for your continued uh, 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 generosity as we seek to live out our call as a congregation during these perilous times. Thank you. And now will you stand as we sing our doxology together. blessed our offerings, so I invite you to continue in worship with our hymn of preparation. If you're worshiping at home, the number is 111 in our hymnal. Let us sing together.
Please be seated. Earl wasn't kidding when he talked about being short-handed, short-staffed for these many months. This was a particularly crazy week. Um, my dog got skunked on Monday. My father fell down in uh, Georgia on Tuesday. And on Wednesday, we arrived to find water cascading down the basement steps. The entire second level of the education wing soaked due to a broken fitting on a toilet. And the kitchen lights were raining. So, we make do. <laughs> and we punt. In this case, um, as we dealt with all of the crazy challenges, uh, and I began to look very differently at how I was going to approach the whole idea of Christian hospitality, radical hospitality. And for me, I realized that it comes down to one thing, and that is love, Christ's love. And so, instead of reading to you uh, from Luke's Gospel, I'm going to share just a few words from the Apostle Paul to the church at Galatia, chapter 3, verses 26 to 29. Hear now what Paul says about what it means to be loved by Christ. For in Christ you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray together. Good and gracious God, in this time of worship, draw us together as one body that we might be more faithful in our love and service to this hurting world. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of my sermon is What Does Love Look Like? I googled this morning and I found these notes from dailygood.org. A group of professional people posed a question to a group of four to eight year olds, what does love mean? <clears throat> I'm going to share with you some of these answers. When my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore, so my grandfather does it for her all the time, even when his hands got arthritis too. That's love. Love is what makes you smile when you're tired. Love is what's in the room with you at Christmas if you stop opening presents and just listen. Isn't that nice? Here's Nikki, age six. If you want to love, learn to love better, you should start with a friend you hate. Somehow I think Jesus would agree with that one, don't you? Love is a little like an old woman and an old man who are still friends even after they know each other so well. That's Tommy, age six. Love is when mommy sees daddy smelly and sweaty and says he is handsomer than Robert Redford. That's love, says Chris, age seven. Oh my, oh my. You know, St. Augustine was asked the same question uh, centuries ago. What does love look like? And here was St. Augustine's response. It is hands to help others. It is feet to hasten to the poor and needy. It is eyes to see misery and ears to hear 
the sighs and sorrows of men. That is what love looks like. Augustine's description reflects what Jesus must have had in mind when he said, I give you <clears throat> a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, I want you to notice something. Love is not optional for the followers of Jesus. He doesn't say, this is what I suggest or this is what I recommend. He says, this is my commandment, a commandment. But I wonder, how can you actually command love? Can you demand feelings and emotions from someone? Certainly not. But you see here, Jesus is not referring to feelings and emotions. He's talking about a different kind of love. It's called agape. Say that with me. Agape love, which is unearned, unconditional, unreserved love. Agape love is not tied <coughs> to our feelings and emotions. It's more like a decision. It's more an act of the will. Excuse me, just. <clears throat> Must be allergy season again. Love is a decision, an act of the will. Jesus commands us to love one another, not only when people have earned it, not only when they are lovable, not only when it benefits us to love, he commands us to discipline our hearts. That's part of what it means to be a disciple and to discipline our minds and our actions and to love other people, whether we feel like it or not. How is that possible? I see some of you screwing up your... How is that possible, we might wonder? Well, in my experience, it isn't possible. That is not under my own power. It's not possible until I have first loved Jesus. And perhaps that's why this is a new commandment. Jesus is charging us to love in a radical new way, the Jesus way. Our love for others is made possible by our love for Christ. Through him, we become brothers and sisters with all people. Barriers come down. For the Apostle Paul writes, in Christ there is no longer male or female, slave or free, Jew nor Greek, all are one. Through Christ we are one family, white and brown, men and women, young and old, poor and rich, gay and straight, Democrat and Republican, masked and unmasked, citizen and undocumented immigrant. When we experience Christ's radical, unconditional love for us, we can then be empowered to love one another with the same kind of love we have received from Christ. This kind of agape love is at the very heart of radical hospitality. In practical terms, what does radical hospitality look like? This week in our book study groups, and you'll see a list of them online and printed on the back of your bulletin, we're going to be discussing the practical aspects of radical hospitality. But this morning, I want to deal with the biblical aspect of radical hospitality. What does it look like from a biblical theological standpoint? In my mind, there's only one answer. 
it looks like Christ's love for us. Or, if you need some symbols to think about, it looks like a welcome mat. It looks like a basin and towel. And it looks like a red bandana. I hope I've got your attention. Do I? My friends, we have a welcome mat because love welcomes. The basis of radical hospitality can be summed up in this verse, verse from Romans 15, 7. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. And how does Christ welcome? Unconditionally, without prejudice or fear. And who does Christ welcome? Well, if you look through the New Testament, you'll see he welcomes all persons. In particular, he welcomes the child, the thief on the cross, a prostitute, an adulteress, the leper, the blind and the lame, the one who climbs a tree in order to get a better view of him, a Roman soldier whose daughter is dying, one who catches fish for a living, another who collects taxes for a living. He loves and welcomes a Samaritan woman of an entirely different faith tradition. Christ even welcomes Peter, who denied him three times, and Judas, who betrayed him to his death. Now, I wonder, how would our congregation, how would this church be transformed if we welcomed new people as Christ has welcomed all people unconditionally? without prejudice or fear? What if each one of us committed to extend God's love to all our neighbors, those who are like us and those who are not? Love looks like a welcome mat because love welcomes. That's radical hospitality. Love also looks like a basin and towel because love serves. When Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you, he was in an upper room celebrating the Jewish festival of Passover with his disciples. This would be their last meal together before his betrayal and death. Jesus got up from the table took off his outer robe and tied a towel around his waist. He poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' filthy feet, wiping them with that towel in an humble, it was a humble act of service. So when Jesus' command is for us to love one another, we know that it's going to mean rolling up our sleeves and getting to work. It means giving ourselves to a life of humble service so that we can feed the hungry and clothe the naked, care for the sick and visit the imprisoned. It means defending the vulnerable, protecting the lives and property of neighbors and securing safety for all persons in our community. Safety from physical harm, safety from hate. It's a tall order, I know. But if we want to wiggle our way out of the difficult parts of this command to love one another, 1 John 4, 19 to 21 convicts all of us. Jesus says, those who say I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister when they, who ha they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. And I misspoke. That was from the apostle John, not from Jesus. 
radical hospitality looks like a towel and basin because love serves. <clears throat> and if Jesus' disciples failed to understand the towel and basin of service, he restated his intention with these words, no one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. My friends, love is costly. It looks a lot like a red bandana. Let me tell you about Wells, me, uh, Wells Remy Crowther. When Wells was six years old, his father handed him a red bandana, explaining the difference between the bandana and a handkerchief. One was for show, the other was for blow. Right. His dad used a blue bandana, but Wells preferred the red one, and it became his trademark. Wherever he went, whatever he did, Wells carried his red bandana. He wore it under his hockey and lacrosse helmets in high school. At age 16, Wells joined his father as a volunteer firefighter, and he trained extensively to become a junior member of the Empire Hook and Ladder Company in Nyack, New York. He later attended Boston College, where he played lacrosse and wore his red bandana for every game. Upon graduation, he moved to New York City, took a job as an equities trader for Sandler O'Neill and Partners, settling into an office on the 104th floor of the South Tower of the World Trade Center. It offered a great view, but Wells was looking beyond that. He called his dad, just a few weeks before 911 to say, Dad, I don't want to spend the rest of my life looking at a computer screen. I want to do more with my life. I want to join the fire department of New York. On September 11, 2001, Wells was at his desk high up in the South Tower when a jet crashed into the North Tower. Minutes later, as hundreds of workers were gathered around elevators on the 78th floor preparing to evacuate, a second jet struck the South Tower amidst the chaos. Wells called his mother at 9.12 a.m. to say, Mom, this is Wells. I wanted you to know that I'm okay. That was the last time Allison Crowther ever heard her son's voice. He was just 23 years old. But hear what happened next. According to a survivor of 911, her name is Ling Young, and this was in an interview with ESPN. All of a sudden, we saw a man come out of nowhere. We heard this man's voice say, I found the stairs, follow me, and only help the one you can help. It was the way he said it. We just got up and followed, she said. With his signature red bandana pulled over his nose and mouth, Crowther led evacuees from the 78th floor down to the 61st floor where they met firefighters and were escorted to safety. Then, instead of evacuating with his group, Crowther climbed back up the stairs to the 78th floor to help another group get out of the burning building. Carrying one badly wounded woman on his back, he led them down to safety, saying, Follow me. I know the way out. I will lead you to safety. Those 911 survivors talk about the heroism of the young man with the red bandana. Six months later, buried under 110 stories of rubble. 
The body of the man with the red bandana was found alongside firefighters in a makeshift command center in the South Tower lobby. Wells had been headed upstairs to the fiery scene again when the South Tower collapsed. He sacrificed his life to save at least a dozen people. Those of us who were saved by Wells Crowther, I think, would agree, love looks like a red bandana because love is costly. As Pastor Tony Evans writes, God's kind of love is sacrificial. If you haven't loved someone to the point of paying a price for that person, then you haven't fully loved yet. I wonder, my friends, what will our love for Christ cost us? In the spirit of radical hospitality, perhaps we will give up our harsh judgment of people who don't think or look or act or behave as we do. Perhaps we will give up our personal preferences about worship and the way that we order the church in order to fulfill God's vision for this church to become more inclusive and intergenerational, more like the beloved community Christ came to this earth to establish. I wonder, will we give up our time, our money, our comfort levels, our prejudices, our talents and emotional resources to welcome all people, all people as brothers and sisters in Christ. This is costly love. All right, let's bring it together. What is radical hospitality? In a nutshell, it is sharing Christ's unreserved, unconditional, and unrestrained love with everyone we encounter. It looks a lot like a welcome mat, a towel and basin, and a red bandana. Because love welcomes, love serves, and love gives and does not count the cost. Ultimately, my friends, that is what love looks like. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. Let all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able to sing our closing hymn number 568, Christ for the World We Sing.
My brothers and sisters, the vision that we affirmed in November of 2019, boy, that sounds like a long time ago now, doesn't it? We are people loving God with our hearts and hands and voices. I think those three things are well illustrated here. Let us love with our hearts, giving and not count the cost. That's radical hospitality. Let us love God this week with our hands, offering service in the name of Christ to those in need. In need. That's radical hospitality. And with our voices, let us love God with words of welcome and affirmation, respect and appreciation for all persons that God has created. My brothers and sisters, as we live out what it means to extend Christ's love to the world, we will become more diverse and inclusive and intergenerational. We will become a more beloved community. Amen. Thank you.